week we're going to take another look at titrations, but we're going to detect them a little bit differently than in the last experiment. So before we get to the pH probe part of things, you are going to be using some indicators again this week. And one thing that may be a little bit difficult sometimes with indicators is determining where the endpoint really is. Now, I noticed quite a few people when we were using the phenolphthalein indicator, you probably went a little too far because you really don't need that indicator to be a super, super intense dark pink color. If you're going from colorless to pink, as soon as you can detect a pink color and it's a persistent pink color, it doesn't go away when you swirl it, that's your end point. You don't need to go all the way to a really, really dark, intense color. So if you're working with phenolphthalein, now this is some of the calibration buffer, but if you're working with phenolphthalein, you may not even be able to see that's very pink on film, but that's plenty pink to indicate where your, your end point is in that titration. So be a little careful with that. Now this week, we're going to be using a couple different indicators, and there are a couple of multicolor indicators. Where phenolphthalein was colorless to pink, this week we're going to be using methyl orange and bromothymol blue. Those are both indicators that are colored both on the acidic side and on the basic side of their endpoint. So, what do those colors look like? Well, I can describe them forever. I can give you all kinds of names for those colors, but it's really not that helpful for you. So what you should do is probably take a look at those indicators both in their acidic and basic form. Easiest way to do that is just take a little bit of water and make sure that you know what an acid and a base form look like. So if I just take some, a couple little test tubes, give them a squirt of water, that should be good. I can test now before I do that test. One of the, I won't say problems, but one of the things that causes a little bit of trouble when people are thinking about indicators is you rely a little bit too much on color to pick your indicators up. With many indicators, that's okay. Bromothymol blue is one where that can get you in trouble because here I've got three different dropper bottles of bromothymol blue and if we look at those, well they're all different colors. One of them is sort of a greenish blue, one of them is a really dark orange brown, and one of them is a little bit lighter orange. So when you're picking out indicators, when you're trying to decide which indicator you're using, don't necessarily rely on just looking at the color. Make sure you're also reading the labels. So back to my water. If I take test tubes that just have a little bit of water and let me do the bromothymol blue, I'll pick the one that looks orange. If I just add a drop or two of indicator to each of those tubes, yeah, it's got a little bit of yellow color to it. Again, probably almost impossible to even see real well on film. But also on your bench, there should be a dropper bottle with some HCl, one molar HCl, and some sodium hydroxide. So if this is just plain water, if I add a drop or two of HCl to one of these tubes, and a drop or two of sodium hydroxide to the other tube. Well now, you can definitely see the difference. You can definitely see that one of these is very much blue. That was the basic side. One of them is yellow. Colors aren't always the easiest thing to see clearly on a video. So I would suggest that you probably take a couple little test tubes. It doesn't take a second or two and give yourself a reference for acid color versus base color on some of those indicators. 
Now the other thing to remember when you're working with multicolor indicators that have two different colors, where is the endpoint? Bromothymol blue, for example. When it's in a very acidic environment, it's yellow. When it's in a very basic environment, it's blue. Well, the endpoint should be right between the more acidic form and the more basic form, right? So, if you've got a yellow form that's in the acidic side, if you've got a blue form that's on the basic side, then the psi or the indicator, the endpoint that's right between those two should be, well, you've all known those little tricks since grade school. So, I'll let you work that out. All right, so those are your indicators. Those indicator titrations are going to be very, very similar to the titrations you did before break. What about the pH meter titration? The pH meter titration actually gives us a ton more information, but we have to do it a little bit differently. So, a couple things that we need to look at when we're setting up that pH meter titration. All right, I've got a few things set up here. Let me take the burette down for just a moment. Now, the first thing that causes a little bit of trouble is that people don't, don't always think outside of, of nice right angles. So if I have my pH probe and Yes, before I use this, I need to calibrate it, so make sure you do that. But if I've got my pH probe, and let's go ahead and just take that completely off. And I insist on mounting that pH probe vertically, which a lot of people try to do. If I mount that pH probe vertically in here, well, to do the experiment, I need to get this burette mounted and in, and you can already see where the problem's coming in. I'm, I'm bouncing the burette off that clamp, and it's hard to get everything aligned properly. So, what do you do? Well, the easiest thing to do there is just tilt it a little bit. These pH probes work perfectly fine if you put a little bit of a tilt on them. And by tilting that pH probe just the tiniest little bit, now all of a sudden you've got a ton of room to get your burette in there. So this is also another reason why when I tell you about burettes, I always nag at you to mount that burette clamp up high on the stand. It's so high you can't even see it here. Because now I've got all this space on the ring stand to mount other clamps and other things. So give that pH probe just a little bit of a tilt and you'll have a much easier time getting everything lined up. Now the other thing that I talked to a few people about last week was be smart about filling your burette. You should do all of your burette filling, anything you're going to pour especially into burette, should be done when it's not over your experiment that's all ready to go. So I've seen any number of people at various times get all of their things all set up, ready to go, lined up, calibrated, then they go to fill the burette and chances are they're going to spill because they're often reaching way too high to try to fill it up. And when they spill, everything goes into their experiment, they've got to start over. So when you want to fill that burette, take it down. Take it down and fill it up at a reasonable height so that you're not trying to stretch up and fill it. This way also, if you spill, you're not going to spill into your experiment. So get your burette filled up, make sure you fill the tip before you start as well. You can't have bubbles in the tip, otherwise your volume readings are going to be off. So that's really all there is to the experiment. Um, make sure that you get things set up so that you can stir your solution and not bounce off the pH probe. 
Make sure that you've got your burette mounted low enough so that you're not going to splash all over the place out the sides, but high enough so that the tip isn't going to end up being in liquid when you get to that part of the experiment, when you've added enough for that part of the experiment. So to start this, measure your known amount of, of sodium carbonate into the beaker. And once you know how much sodium carbonate is in here, that's really the last time you have to worry about volume. So again, just like with all titrations, anything you're using a pH probe for, anything you're using most of these probes for, have that bottle of deionized water ready and just add it whenever you need it. If you need to wash things down a little bit, wash things down. In this case, if you need to add enough to get the volume up to where it's reading on the pH probe, add 15 or 20 milliliters and you should be doing just fine. This experiment specifically is very, very sensitive to the water you use. So I just pulled this out of this drawer and there's a label on it that says DIH2O. That should be deionized water, but I have no idea who filled this bottle up. I have no idea how long this bottle has been sitting in that drawer. So if I were using this, if I were doing this experiment, I would probably almost always dump any wash bottle out, give it a little rinse with deionized water and then refill it myself so that I know that what's in here is good, fresh, deionized water and it won't cause trouble in my experiment. When you're completely finished with your experiment for the day, make sure you take the burette off the stand, drain the burette out completely, give it a rinse with some of that good deionized water, and just to make sure that we're consistent about who's doing what and where, I like to mount these burettes with the stopcock open. I like to mount these burettes upside down in the stands for the next class. That way the next person who comes in will see that and hopefully be able to trust that you rinsed your burette out with the ionized water. It'll have a little bit of a chance to dry out sitting upside down as long as you leave that stopcock open and they can take that burette down and then be ready to do their experiment when they're going. For the pH probe titration where we're going to be measuring pH as we add, you need to set the computer up. I'm not going to go into all the little details. I think most of you have used this uh, program. The interface is enough that you're starting to get a feel for it. There is a specific uh, experiment file for this experiment and hopefully not too shockingly the name of that experiment file is titrations so if you go into the chemistry lab folder that's on the desktop you should find a job file called titrations.cmbl I think is the extension click on that to open and it should launch logger pro with the correct job file loaded the job that it's going to load is an event-driven collection. So you've done that before with some of the things that you've, that you've done. Now it's just going to be a matter of doing it with, um, with the pH probes. So you're going to have a collect button to hit at the start. You're going to have a keep button that you have to hit after every, um, after every addition that you do. Now this is another place where sometimes people get a little sidetracked in the middle of the experiment. When you're doing these additions, and you're doing about half milt additions all the way through the experiment, when you're doing the addition, you need to let the experiment stir long enough so that it all mixes, but you don't want to let it stir so long that you end up spending 11 hours doing your experiment. So usually, I'd say it's a pretty, pretty fair estimate to say if you do your addition, let it stir for 10 or 15 seconds, that's probably enough. Then hit keep. Be careful when you hit keep because as soon as you hit keep on here, it takes a reading and doesn't read anymore. So don't hit keep too quickly and then wait 10 seconds because that doesn't do any good. But do your addition, wait for 10, 15 seconds or so, then hit keep, 
enter the total volume that you've added, and you're ready for your next addition. That's the other problem that people can get into here. You're, you're always inputting the total volume that you've added. You're not inputting half a milliliter over and over and over and over again. So the best way to do this, take an initial reading on your burette, and then just start doing additions. Take your second reading, subtract the initial, that's the total amount you've used. If that sounds like a little bit too much hassle, then you can absolutely just hand record your data, plug it into Excel, and make the graph. Um, the graphs really turn out looking essentially the same either place. Using the Logger Pro software to do that collection is kind of a nice little feature. And there are a few things you can play with in the data um, analysis menu that, that can make some of the things easier. So that's all I'm really going to say about the computer setup. Calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. If you're not sure, calibrate. So for these titrations, you should be able to do a calibration at the beginning of the titration, and it should be fine for the whole length of the titration. By the time you get to the end of the titration, you're definitely going to need to recalibrate before you go on and do your measurements in the buffer portion of the experiment. But that's the buffer portion of the experiment. And that's pretty much how the pH meter titration is going to go. So this week, we're going to do three titrations using indicators. We're going to do a titration using a pH meter. And the last part of the experiment is looking at some buffers and how buffers behave. That's why the sodium hydroxide and HCl droppers are on the bench. So take a look at that and I'll see you in lab. Mm -hmm.